12 years of ministry, you're at least getting that concept from this pulpit that verses have meanings in a context and they have meaning in a book of the Bible and they have a meaning in the Bible as a whole and we can't take it out of there and make it say something that it does not say. God is love. Okay, that's the one we hear most readily all the time. God is love, God is love. I just want to say, could you answer me one question and I'll be willing to have this conversation with you. Uh, what's your question, sir? My question is, is what is 1 John 4 really about? If they can answer that question, then perhaps we can have the conversation. And say, well, I don't have the foggiest clue what 1 John's about. It's about false prophets. It's about people who do not confess Christ rightly. It's about those who are not brothers in the Lord, but are separate because of their falsehood. And then he establishes God is love, but his love is evidently seen in those that are his. And if we're not his, in that same chapter, it says his judgment is coming upon them. Well, that just drastically impacted my view of God is love. Okay? But think about that as well. They're doing this from the pulpit. It's affecting us. We take out a phrase, God is love. Watch, it supersedes every other line in the whole chapter of 1 John 4. Now give me a valid reason that I can take God is love and make it more important than chapter 4, verse 1. And you say, well, I like this verse. Well, that's nice, but that doesn't make it more or less true than verse 1 where two or three are gathered in my name does not make it more or less important than Matthew 18, 18 that says I'm to confront my brother one-on-one -on -one with me and him alone. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I'm God. That verse is not more important than verse one, I assure you. So we can't pick and match and make God fit my own presupposition into my theology. Why am I telling you this? Because that is the very agenda of what is happening from the pulpit of the local church. And thus, when there is actual and real preaching verse by verse and applied contextually to a people, there are some who get very aggravated and angry. Why? Because they've never heard it. When you go, or as I have gone many times, and I have preached funerals, when I preach a funeral, sometimes people have become irate. Why? Because they have never sat under biblical preaching in which the Word of God is brought forth in a right context and preached from a right heart that loves God. They've not heard it, and so that must be wrong. What they're hearing from the pulpit... That verse says, that verse says, and well, you know, you know, well, you know what the Bible says? It says God works out everything to the good of those who love Him. Isn't that special? I feel better. I got goosebumps. Could we finish the verse, much less the context? Could we at least finish? You watch. You hear that, and you'll hear that much of it quoted, and they leave the rest alone. To those who are called according to oh now we've defined the group now it's getting narrow we don't like it God works all things together for good you think that Esau believed that you think the rich man in Lazarus in Luke 16 says he's down there in hell and he looks up to Abraham and he says look I know God's working out for my good and God's going to bring me a drip of water on my tongue because he's all about my good you think that's thought? No, it's not the thought. God works all things together for good for those who love Him, those who love Him, and those who are called according to His purpose. Now we've defined the group. Well, who are they? Well, those He predestined, He foreknew, and those He foreknew, He called, and those He called, He justified, and those He justified, He glorified. Now I know who we're talking about. At least in looking at three verses, I can get a better application and understanding of what God's Word is actually saying rather than taking a little phrase and putting it on a little piece of paper at so-and-so's funeral where everybody will feel better about the situation. We do it all the time. I'm saying, I'm not preaching that to you that you've done it. I'm not getting on to you. I'm saying that's what has happened as a result of weak, pathetic, watered-down, anemic pulpits in our land. I'm preaching to myself and being reminded that I cannot slip off into that or I'll be just as guilty as anybody else.
The pulpit is the place in which it's time to do business with God. As Luther said, draw a circle around the pulpit and it is there that I'm closer to God than anywhere else. It is here that I must give an account for your souls. It is here that I must give an account for the teaching ministry that is done in this pulpit. It is here that the body and the local assembly of FBC Briar is somewhat guided spiritually. This is where it happens. This is what we're taught. This is what is preached. This is what is lived. And it has an effect upon us. It does have an effect upon us, doesn't it? I mean, we are here, I hope. I, I can't speak for you, but I hope we are here because we want to hear God's word rightly because we don't want watered-down misapplication and stories and funny jokes. We actually want to know, what does God say? As W.A. Criswell says, and you hear it on the radio sometimes, stand in the pulpit and cry out, Thus saith the Lord. That's what the pulpit is for. It is by that one little member, the tongue, behind the pulpit that the body is directed. I would think that so if it was God's will that if I fell over dead today or tomorrow and this church obtained another preacher to fill this pulpit where this church could continue on, that the common thought of the body would be in agreement. We must find a man who will deal with the text rightly. Nothing less will do. We must find somebody who believes in the sufficiency of the Scriptures for the building of God's church. If they don't have that, we're not interested. I would hope that would be the case and you would realize that it is the pulpit that has had great effect upon the local body, the church. Secondly, that's the primary application, I believe, of this text. Secondly, Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. I see a transition, if you will, here. It's not just the pulpit, but it gets moved to all of us. We all do stumble in many ways. And he begins to address his tongue. Primarily the captain of the ship, or the cowboy on the horse, or the guy behind the pulpit. But secondarily, and still appropriately, it must be addressed. That those in the local body, those who make up the congregation, that we, with our words, have an effect upon the body of the church. Let me say it as clear as I know how to say it. What you say in regards in the involvement of the local church has an effect upon the body. The, you could form groups that are anti or opposed to the pastor and develop a group that would say all these things. You can develop a group that is against the Sunday school teacher. You can develop a group that is opposed to this group or that person or that person and you can begin to talk and bring out negatives about them. Happens in church. I'm not proud of it, but it happens in churches all over the world. Do you know that people have been scarred for life because of what is said in the local church. You know, people have been hurt drastically and there are some still this very day who have not gotten over what was said to them or about them or around them within the local church. How bad it hurt, how deep it cut, how it broke their heart. Those came because of words. I grew up in church. I know what it means to see a mother crying, a father crying, a wife crying, children crying, church members hurt. I understand. I've seen that. I've lived that. I've felt that. I just want you to know, church body, what we say in regards to each other within the local body of the church, it does have an effect, and sometimes it really hurts. It hurts bad, and people are destroyed because of it. There's people sitting at homes this morning that will not venture to darken the doors of any church in Azel because of what happened in churches in Azel. Whoa, all over our land because so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and it really has hurt. Now, I know you could take the position. You could say, well, get over it. Suck it up and quit your whining. I know you can be prideful and say that, but I'm just trying to bring out the reality of this. People have real hurts, real emotions. They have real feelings. Words really do affect them. Words really affect the state and the life of the church. Negativity breeds negativity. It just does. 
not charismatic, but there's a sense in which the tongue actually does have a lot of power here to destroy or to build up. The tongue does that. Take great caution in the hallway, in the foyer, in the parking lot. You know, that preacher, do you know what he did? It can be very damaging. You know what the chairman of deacons did last week? You know what I heard? Very damaging. Did you, do you know what so-and-so did in our class? You know what he did the other day? Those things can cause great destruction. You know, churches close down. You know, churches fold up. You know, down there in Port Arthur, there's a, a, a Buddhist temple. So why is there a Buddhist temple? Because the Baptist church closed and the Buddhist temple bought it. Why? I'd venture to say it's tied to somebody's word somewhere along the line. Oh, we can't make it or something. Somebody got mad. Somebody did this. People really, truly get hurt. Pastors get fired. Pastors' wives get stabbed in the back. Church members get crucified. People really get destroyed because of the tongue. You say, you may say at this point in the sermon, you say, Pastor, why are you being so hard on the tongue? Listen, how great a blaze is set on fire, a forest is set on fire by just a little bitty spark. That's the way James talks. Just down the street, we, 